welcome and God bless. Thank you for joining us on our Victory Outreach Church of Tacoma podcast. On behalf of Pastor Eric and Sister Jessica, we want to thank you for tuning in. For more information on the church and upcoming events, please visit us at VOTacoma.org. Scripture, Exodus chapter 40, verse 12. Number 12, um, we are going to read four verses this morning, and um, just out of respect for God and the reading of his word, we're going to go ahead, um, stand and we're going to go ahead and read it. The Bible reads like this, here Moses, or God is speaking to Moses, and this is what he tells him. Give it up for the worship team also. The Bible reads like this, Exodus 40 verse 12, bring Aaron and his sons and the entrance to the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Someone say wash. wash. Then dress Aaron in the sacred garments, anoint him and consecrate him so he may serve me as priests. Bring his sons and dress them in tunics, anoint them just as you anointed their father so they may serve me as priests. Their anointing will be to a priesthood that will continue throughout generations. And Moses did everything just as the Lord had commanded him. I want to read it to you in the New American Standard Version. I love how it's worded here. It says, bring his sons and dress them in tunics, and you shall anoint them even as you have anointed their fathers, that they may minister as priests to me, and their anointing will qualify them for a perpetual priesthood throughout their generations. You may be seated this morning. Give the person next to you a high five. Amen. And this morning, um, if you can turn me down a little bit in the monitor, please. This morning, I want to speak to you for the next few moments about the difference maker within a person's life that allows them to do great things for God. Someone say difference maker. And what I want to talk to you about this morning is I want to talk to you about the anointing of God. You know, years ago when I first gave my life to the Lord, I remember applying for a job online. And after I applied for a job, uh, this job, I received a phone call and they asked me to come in for an in-person interview. And I remember the day of the interview, I, I got up early. How many know that when you go into an interview, sometimes it's nerve-wracking? So I remember going in. I, I, I dressed up a little bit. At that time, whether you believe me or not, I had long hair to the middle of my back. And I remember I was, I was, I was, I was caught with this decision, do I cut my hair? Because most people told me, hey, you got to cut your hair or nobody's going to hire you. Nevertheless, I didn't cut my hair and I went into the interview. And when I got to the company, they had me take a written test, which they basically wanted to see if I had the right qualifications, and they wanted to see if I had good decision-making skills. After I took the test, I sat with the, uh, the, the, the gentleman from the company, and he went on to ask me a series of questions about the job. At the end of the interview, he told me the words that most people do not want to hear when they finish an interview. Do you know what those words are? We will call you. He said, we will be in touch. I remember walking out from the interview. I felt like I did pretty well. A few days later, I received a phone call from the interviewing manager, and he proceeded to tell me, Eric, um, I'm calling you to inform you that, that, that we are going to move in a different direction and we have actually, you didn't receive the job. And he went on to tell me that we hired somebody that is more qualified for the position. Now, I remember that after he told me those words, it really hurt my self-esteem. And after that experience, I remember, I remember developing this fear to interview for specific jobs because one, I was afraid of rejection and number two, I was afraid of hearing the words, you, were, you are not qualified for this position. And this is a mindset that I kept for years. Later on, I gave my life to the Lord and I walked into the church and I still had this mentality within my spirit that 
I wanted to do something great for God. I would come to church and I would hear preachers say things like, God has called you to do great things. If you want to do great things for God, you can do it in Jesus' name. But I remember sitting in my seat. I would hear the messages. Passion was welling up inside of me. But although I had passion, I had a negative mindset that constantly said, you don't have anything to offer. Have you ever been there? Well, this morning, I, I want to teach you a lesson that someone told me years ago when I gave my life to the Lord. And that's the lesson that God does not look for what man looks for. See, the world has a way of sizing us up. The world has a way of asking for specific qualifications. But what you have to understand this morning about the Lord is that God's system is far different from the world system. See, what you have to understand this morning is that you don't have to be qualified to do a great work for God. If God has called you, he will qualify you to do whatever it is that he's putting within your heart. See, when God searches for a man or a woman to do something great for his sake, he does not look at qualified people, but he qualifies the people that he calls. And this morning, I want to speak to you about the difference maker and what God can do through your life if we are willing to pursue a holy lifestyle. How many know that holiness is still a prerequisite for God's power and spirit? The formula to holiness has never changed. Though the standard of the world may fall, we still have to fight tooth and nail to keep a pure heart and remain faithful to the Lord no matter what we go through. But when you look at the scripture we opened up with, we read of a time where God calls Aaron and his sons to a specific task. God speaks to Moses, the leader at that time, and he tells him, bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance to the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Then dress Aaron in his sacred garments, anoint him and consecrate him so he may serve me as a priest. So again, here we have God speaking to Moses. He gives him specific instruction for this man named Aaron. And he's calling him and his sons to a specific task. He tells them to wash them, consecrate them, which simply means separate them. And then they anointed them. Now, what does it mean to be anointed? What does the word anoint mean? Well, when you do an extensive study on the word, there are a number of ways that you can interpret that word. But the word anoint means to authorize, to set apart a person for a particular work of service. When you look up the Greek word, it's a word called mashak, and this means to smear, to anoint, or to rub with oil, or to separate. See, in ancient times, what would happen was when God would raise up a priest, or when God would raise up a king, the priest would come, and they would anoint them, or smear them with oil, and what this was, it was a ceremony, it was a ceremony that basically showed God's approval and spirit upon a person's life. When someone was appointed as king, they would often go before the people, and sometimes in secret, and they would pour oil over their head, now this act was symbolic of God's approval upon someone's life. So here we see, again, God speaks to Aaron. And this is one of the things that I want you to catch this morning. Is that God will call you to do something specific and you don't have to have the qualifications. But God will anoint your life to do whatever it is that he's asking you to do. Not only that, the anointing that you have if you're the head of household this morning, you need to know that that anointing is also translates and can be transferred to your children. Because here, God was calling Aaron, but then he also separated his sons. And what does the Bible say? You shall anoint them even as you have anointed their father. Here we see God was anointing and appointing Aaron's family to be a priest. This was a very specific task. Priests during the Old Testament were official ministers or worship leaders in the nation of Israel who represented the people before God. Stick with me, I'm going somewhere. This wasn't something they were qualified for, but this was something that God would give them the ability to do. And this is why he said, and their anointing will qualify them for perpetual priesthood. See, when God calls someone to do something specific, he will always separate you. Separate you from what? He will separate you from the world. Are you hearing me? See, there are many today, you're here, 
and God is doing something within your heart and you've come to a crossroad where you're feeling God pull you in a direction that is away from the world. But the world is going to constantly try to woo you, win you over and draw you in to a specific lifestyle. See, God wants to, I believe, raise up people in this day, in this, in this very hour, so that we can make a difference. How many know that the great revival is still supposed to happen? And before revival can happen, something must first die. And I hate to say it, but in some, in some sense, our conviction and belief to stand in God's will in many churches have died. Passion is often attacked because passion is what will keep you standing, are you hearing me, when everything comes against you. See, when we speak of the anointing upon a person's life, we are talking about the Spirit of God living and working through someone. The anointing of God is the evidence that the Spirit of God lives and works through a person's life. A perfect example of this is when you come to church and you hear someone sing a song and it's as if God's presence hovers over them. That is an example of the Spirit of God or the anointing upon someone's life. Another example of the anointing is when God goes beyond the natural ability of a person and gives him supernatural ability to preach, teach, or counsel. See, the anointing of God is evident when a person senses God's spirit all over them and they are compelled to respond. Have you ever come and heard a message or you ever come to church and you just felt the power of God all over your life and you felt compelled to change? That's the anointing of God. Now, the anointing of God, again, is evident when, when a person senses God's spirit all over them and they are compelled to respond. And this is what you have to understand about God's spirit and God's anointing. Prior to Jesus' death on the cross, the Holy Spirit's power was not entirely available to God's people. Therefore, God would anoint a person with his spirit and power, and the Holy Spirit would empower them to bring about God's will. Jeremiah 27, 5 says, With my great power and outstretched arm, I made the earth and its people and the animals that are in it, and I give it to anyone I please. See, God can give his power to anyone that he pleases. God would empower his servants to accomplish a great task. And although the Holy Spirit was not permanently available to God's people, he worked through them and gave them the power to achieve things they would not have been able to accomplish on their own. Are you hearing me this morning? See, I want to give you a few examples of people that God anointed. And I want to look at their life and show you how God can use even the things that seem insignificant to make a big change in the kingdom. The first person I want to talk to you about is a man by the name of Bezalel. Now, Bezalel can be found in Exodus 31, and he was anointed to be the chief artisan of the tabernacle, and his name meant in the shadow of God. See, God anointed and appointed Bezalel to a specific task in building the Ark of the Covenant and many of the articles that were found in the temple. Exodus 31, let me read it to you. Just listen to these words. It says, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, see, I have called by name, someone say by name, Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship to design artistic works to work in gold, in silver, in bronze, in cutting jewels, or setting and carving wood, and to work in all manners of workmanship. And I indeed, I have appointed with him Eliowab, the son of Amishak, from the tribe of Dan, and I have put wisdom in his heart of all gifted artisans, and that they may make all that I have commanded you. So here we see God, he calls a man by the name of Bezalel by name. Now the Bible tells us that he gives him wisdom, that he gives him knowledge, and he gives him the ability in all workmanship. Not only did God appoint Bezalel, but God also called and appointed an assistant named Eliab. Now these men, you know, when you read scriptures like this, you can really just read over it. But what is interesting is when you do an in-depth study about 
the blueprint that God gave Moses, many scholars believe this. Well, this is something that I read. It said, the candlestick of the sanctuary was so complicated in nature that Moses could not comprehend it. And although God twice showed him a heavenly model, but he was unable to describe it. So when he showed it to Bezalel, Bezalel immediately was able to create whatever God wanted. Now this is what you have to understand about even building God's sanctuary and building God's church. Yes, Moses was the leader, but what Moses could not comprehend with his mind, he anointed Bezalel to fulfill. See, churches are not built on one person. Moses was full with wisdom. Moses had the ability to lead and administer his people. But God had called Bezalel by name and gave him the anointing to, to, to work and build exactly what he wanted. How I many know we serve a God that is a very detailed God? Another interesting fact is that Bezalel is said to have only been 13 years of age when he accomplished this great work. Now, you know what's interesting about that is? Listen, if you're young here, I need you to understand something. God doesn't look at age. God can use you if you're young. God can use you if you're older, if you're in between. God looks for someone that has a willing heart to fulfill and advance his kingdom. Listen to me, church. It doesn't matter what the task is. Don't rule yourself out because of the thinking that I don't have what it takes because God will anoint your life and fill you with his spirit so that you can accomplish the task see sometimes we look at the gifts that we have and we see them small you might like to bake this morning and you might be very good at it and you might think well what could that do for the Lord let me tell you what that could do for the Lord you know we want to build a welcome center in this room here but do you imagine what kind of atmosphere we would have if all the bakers that had passion came together, baked fresh baked cookies. Come on, somebody. See, Doubletree has it down right. Right? Who's ever been to Doubletree? They come and they give you those warm chocolate cookies. Come on, somebody. Now, I know who I have in my church, and I know that there are some of you that, that you can bake real well. You can make lemon bars. Come on, somebody. You can make brownies. But imagine if we just developed this welcome center and people after would come, have a cup of tea, have some coffee, or maybe have some iced tea and grab a, grab a donut, grab a lemon bar, grab something that you baked. Now, now to, to everyone else, it might seem insignificant, but what you just did, you created a connection point, you created a reason for someone to stay, and they may have, during that period of time that they stayed, had a conversation with somebody that would give them hope and later change their life. Are you hearing me? See, there are some of you, you have the administrative gift. You get paid to manage. You get paid to put things together. Well, we need your talent and we need your skill so that we can put on excellent events. And without you, we would never reach our full potential. Are you hearing me this morning? See, God can use the little things that we feel are insignificant to advance his kingdom. God anointed this man named Bezalel in workmanship to build his kingdom. The second person that I want to talk to you about that God anointed is a man by the name of David. I'm sure you've read about him. You know, really studying his life over, there was some very interesting things that I didn't catch the first few times that I read, but Samuel, you know, the man of God was asked by the Lord to go into Bethlehem and anoint somebody. And 1 Samuel 16 gives us the account, and this is what it says. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise and anoint him, for this is the one. Someone say the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. See, David is another example of a man who was anointed and appointed by God. Now what I love about David's story is that David's story is the ultimate story of an underdog. See, the Bible tells us that he was overlooked. You know what's interesting is that he was overlooked by his father. He was even overlooked by Samuel the prophet. Listen to what it says in 1 Samuel 16, 7. He comes and he looks at his brother, Eliab, and Samuel thought, surely this is the one 
that you want to anoint. And this is what God tells him. Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Later on, Samuel, after he hears this from the Lord, he asks Jesse, the, 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 the father of David, he said, do you have anyone else? And listen to what he said. He said, wait a minute, there's one more. And he calls David. And that's who God chose to anoint. See, David didn't look the part. David was even overlooked. But God chose to anoint him because of his heart. See, when, when nobody see, and this morning, when I was praying, I really sensed that there are some of you feel like you're overlooked. You feel forgotten. You feel like, like God has forgotten you, but I have good news for you. You're like David in the shepherd's field. Nobody may see you right now, but you know what's interesting? David wasn't anointed to be king that day. He was anointed when he stood up for the sheep when the bear came in to try to take it. See, David had developed the anointing of a king and a shepherd when he fought the lion and he was willing to lay down his life for insignificant rewards. Listen, if you're willing to lay your life down for what might seem to be insignificant, God will use your life. This is why we have to be willing to do the little things. Listen, like I said, before I'm a pastor, I'm still a servant. Sometimes we overlook things, but, but don't ever lose the heart of a servant. Because before God uses our gifts, God is far more concerned with the condition of our heart than the work of our hands. See, David had the right heart. He may not have had all the gifts, but he had the right heart. And as a matter of fact, David had become king because someone else blew it. Are you hearing me? God had called uh, um, Saul to be king. But Saul leaned on his own understanding. And he wasn't obedient to God. And one of the things that we have to learn as Christians, we have to learn to be obedient to the Lord with whatever it is that he asks us to do. David may not have been considered but he was chosen by God. Listen, you don't have to be considered if you have been called by God. God will anoint and appoint you with the right gifts at the right moment if you stay strong. Do not grow weary in well-doing. If you have been trying something and you keep failing, but God told you to do it, you stand your ground because God will eventually anoint you to fulfill the task. There are many in the Bible, but the last one I want to tell you, talk to you about is Jesus. Jesus was, was anointed to be Savior of the world. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the Bible tells us, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Here Jesus is speaking to the crowd. Because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set liberty those who are oppressed. See, these words display the heart and the, mind, the, the mindset of the Lord. See, God had anointed and appointed his son Jesus to die on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Now, I have some good news and some bad news this morning. Which one do you want to hear first? The bad news. The bad news is the anointing of God is not cheap. The good news is, is that the anointing of God is av available to you and I. Jesus was the anointed one, but he died on the cross. See, God wants to anoint us, but we have to be willing to live a lifestyle that he can anoint. Do you imagine God giving power to someone that is corrupted on the inside? Are you hearing me this morning? This isn't one of those popular messages, but we, we have to get to a place where we know that God wants to change some things within our lives. He wants to deal with that judgment. He wants to deal with that pride. He wants to deal with those areas within our life that we know are wrong. Is anybody with me? See, God's anointing has been made available to you and I. 1 John 2.20 says, but you have an you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. 1 John 2.27 says, But the anointing which you have received from Him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true and is not a lie, and just as He has taught you, you will abide in Him. 
See, Christ has put his anointing inside of us. And it's the anointing of God that will teach us truth from a lie. It is the anointing of God that will give us the ability to build his church. It's the anointing of God that will allow you to disciple somebody, not unto yourself, but unto God. It's the anointing of God that's going to allow some of you to write books one day. It's the anointing of God that is going to teach you to play the piano, Eric. It's the anointing of God ever that is going to sustain your work and your dedication to that men's home. See, there are some of you, you're here this morning, and the work that God has given you may seem far-fetched. I remember when they told me I was going to be a pastor, I said, I, I don't know if I can do that. But I remember the Lord putting it upon my heart that he would anoint my life. Listen, God wants to anoint your life to do something specific for his honor and his glory. But like I said, God doesn't hand out his anointing like candy. Are you hearing me this morning? God is willing to anoint us, but we have to be willing to pay a price for God's spirit and God's power operating and working through us. Because the Bible tells us what does darkness have to do with light? Listen to me, church. We have to be careful that we don't, we don't develop a, a passive spirit. Or a tolerant spirit. Because sometimes we tolerate things in our house that are not right, but we do it in the name of love. But is it really in the name of love? When it completely conflicts with what the Bible says? We have to make sure that our commitment is first to God. I said this last week. Listen, when it comes to our foundations, your foundations will be made off your beliefs, your actions, and your values. Now, now, your family cannot be your foundation. They could be your inspiration. They could be your motivation, but they cannot be your foundation. God's foundation is the only foundation that will stand. And if we're go going to fulfill his will upon our lives, we need to make sure that we cleanse ourselves from all unrighteousness and ask him to fill us with his spirit so that we do things his way. See, God desires to anoint our life with his spirit. However, before we can walk in his anointing, God must first wash and cleanse, our, cleanse us from anything he is not authorized within our lives. Notice it wasn't until after Aaron and his sons were washed that Moses anointed him. Exodus 40 verse 12, bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. It wasn't until after that, in verse number 13, he said, Now anoint him and consecrate him so he may serve me as priests. It wasn't until after he was washed that God anointed his life. Listen to me, Victory Outreach Tacoma. God wants to anoint his people. The anointing of God has been made available to us. 2 Corinthians 1.21 says, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us in God, who also has sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. God has promised us a helper, the Holy Spirit. God is willing to impart his spirit within us. But we have to live repentive lives. We have to be willing to stand for what is right and no longer accept the things that we know are wrong. Are you hearing me this morning? If God has called you, if God is putting a burden and a passion inside of you, you have to know that he will anoint that, that, that passion and that gift. The thing that God puts inside of you, if it aligns itself with the word of God, Chances are it's the Lord that put it there. And it's time for us to stand and do the things that he's called us to do. Are you with me this morning? I'm going to ask you to stand with me.